So please keep those questions coming, but we're going to move on into SB4 now. Now, um, what what I want to say at the outset, again, is um, we got to be really clear that what's happening on the state level is certainly related, but it's a different law from what is happening at the federal level. So it is important to understand what SB4 does mean and what it doesn't mean. And it's important to keep our eye on what's happening in the courts. There's already been a challenge to SB4. However, keep in mind that regardless of what happens with SB4 in Texas, um, ICE is still allowed to do whatever they, they are allowed to do uh, from the Department of Homeland Security level. Um, everything we're going to talk about for the next few minutes related to state law does not govern ICE. Um, what what SB4 does essentially is not create a policy statewide for law enforcement um, conduct. In fact, it's a prohibition on law enforcement policies related to immigration enforcement. What it says, and, and we're going to go through some key provisions. I, I promise you we will not go through line by line of the entire bill. It's about 40 pages and you all would fall asleep. But I have, I've taken the liberty to to pull out some of the key provisions that are most relevant to, to your all's day-to-day -day work. Um, and, and this first section here on the prohibition on sanctuary cities is really, um, you can think of it as kind of the thesis statement of the bill. What it says is that um, if, a, if a local law enforcement agency, a campus police department or a state police are thinking about any kind of policy that would prohibit um, police from cooperating with federal immigration agents, they can't do that. Um, basically, this state law says you have to cooperate with any uh, immigration enforcement request that the feds um, request. So you can, if you look at the language of, of un underlined here, it talks about um, a policy that the law enforcement department has adopted to limit their own enforcement of federal law. And what it says is they can't do that. What it also talks about is not only a written policy, but a, a practice as demonstrated by, by a pattern or you know, just the regular practice of the department, even if it's not in writing. So it, 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 it's pretty broad. Um, a, a law enforcement agency could get in trouble for refusing to uh, assist in enforcing federal law enforcement or federal immigration law, even if it's not totally in writing, even if somebody just says, look, you didn't write it down, but um, th this is obviously what you're doing as a, as a regular practice. It also goes a step further. This is this is literally like the next few lines below what you just saw. In addition to the, the department not being allowed to have a policy uh, limiting their cooperation with federal immigration officials, it also says that a local law enforcement agency cannot prohibit their individual officers from inquiring into the immigration status of a person who's under lawful detention. So um, this is aimed at, uh, you know, somebody's arrested for, for you name it, and maybe that individual officer wants to find out, is this person um, uh, in the country legally? Um, what the law says, effective September 1st, is that um, local, local law enforcement department can't have a policy prohibiting that officer from asking that. And I want to take a second here. I, I don't know if y'all are intimately familiar with Arizona's show me your papers law that got struck down in the courts, but this is an interesting uh, distinction between that and, and what we have going on in Texas. Um, in, in the past, some of the laws that have been struck down um, actually required they affirmatively required officers to ask. That's not what our law says. Our law says that the department can't prohibit somebody. So it's almost like a um, uh, uh, preserving the like the liberty or the discretion of the individual officer um, and, and not making them beholden to, to their boss if their boss feels like they shouldn't be asking about this stuff. Um, now, Pardon me while we get a little bit legally, but I think it's really important when we look at this language to, to ask, okay, so what does a lawful detention mean? 
that can mean a lot of things, right? It's not just under arrest. So they, they go further to define that. And lawful detention means um, basically somebody is in custody. Uh, it could mean they're under arrest in the field. It could mean they're in jail uh, awaiting arraignment. It could mean that they're um, in custody after adjudication. It also says that if the only reason that somebody somebody's under detention is the fact that they're a victim of a crime or a witness to a crime or they're reporting a crime, that person is not considered to be under detention. So it's a little funky, right? It's it's a little it's a little uh, difficult to imagine a situation where somebody has been a victim of a crime is isn't under detention, not just being questioned by the police, but is under detention from the police. And also the only reason that they're under detention is the fact that they've been a victim of a witness, right? It's not, it's not a situation where you've been a victim of a crime, but you were also caught with drugs on you or something like that. That would count as detention. But if the only reason that you're under detention is that you're a victim, then this excludes it. So there's a little bit of an exception that might apply to some of our clients, but uh, I'll be honest with you, I find it a little murky. Uh, it's a little unclear what situations that would cover. And um, yeah, I, th I think a lot of folks who are reporting a crime um, probably wouldn't be under detention anyway. So um, this wouldn't on its face apply to them, but it clearly contemplates some situations where a victim might uh, uh, also be engaging in some criminal conduct at the time they were victimized and then would be indeed covered by the law. Okay, so I saw a question earlier, I think it might have been from Nubia at Catholic Charities, was asking about this places of worship. There, there are a couple exceptions that were placed into the law um, that, that cover a couple things. So we're going to dive into those a little bit. One of them has to do with uh, places of worship. And this is the bare text of it. It says that um, the local law enforcement department may adopt a policy that prohibits officers from assisting or cooperating with federal enforcement if the assistance occurs at a place of worship. So the idea is to create this, this uh, kind of classic idea of a, of a place of sanctuary in places of worship. Um, I, will, I, I will note that it's, again, pretty narrow, right? It talks about not only um, somebody who, who's like located at a place of worship or, you know, like the assistance itself from law enforcement, which could take the form of detaining a person who is undocumented. It could take the form of um, honoring, uh, honoring some kind of request from ICE to help locate that person. It just means that the assistance or cooperation can't occur at the place of worship. Now, does that mean that if they know somebody is at a place of worship, they can't wait for them to be somewhere else to then assist federal immigration officials? No, they certainly can. And, and I, I expect that if somebody was very interested in helping ICE and something like that, then, um, then they could do that. So there is this narrow exception. They can't, under state law, they couldn't like bust down the doors at a church. But uh, I, I, I would think that there are ways around that if they really want to help ICE find somebody. Next exception um, pertains specifically to victims and witnesses. Now, there's some express language in the statute that says that police officers uh, are allowed to inquire about a victim or a witness's immigration status, but only if the officer determines that's necessary to investigate the offense that they were victimized by, or for the purpose of helping the victim or witness by giving them information about U visas and T visas. Um, so by, the, by its own terms, that sounds great, right? If, if the only purpose of talking to this person is that they, they've been a victim or a witness, they're not under detention for some other offense, then uh, they're not supposed to be asking about immigration status. That's great to know. Um, but that's not the whole story. And, and I think that if we're going to be uh, fair to our clients, if we're going to like provide somebody all the information they need to know 
in order to um, uh, make the best decisions for their own safety and their, the safety of their families. Uh, we have to know the other side of this. Um, the very next section talks about uh, uh, the limits of that exception. There's, there's, <laughs> there's an exception to the exception. So what this goes on to say is that even though police aren't supposed to be asking about immigration status, if the sole purpose uh, that, they're in, that they're encountering somebody is they've been a victim or witness, they're not prevented from conducting a separate investigation of any other crime that might be co-occurring with the victimization. And they're also not prohibited from asking about the immigration status of the victim or, or witness if the officer has probable cause to believe that the victim or witness had also engaged in, in some other criminal conduct. So you can imagine, um, you know, uh, we used this example a, a minute before, ago, but, you know, if somebody had been raped and also had drugs on them or in their system at the time, um, there's nothing in this exception that prohibits police from, from asking about immigration status or asking about that co-occurring criminal offense, the drug offense, um, as they're receiving the complaint. Now, I would hope that uh, law enforcement would certainly prioritize the, the, the more severe offense, the, the violent sexual assault, in a situation like that. Um, but I bring up the, the example just to show you kind of the limits of the exception. They're, they might not do that in every case, but they're allowed to under the law, regardless of what the exception says for victims and witnesses. Um, and I think it's important to think about this in context of what we talked about a, a minute ago too, where sort of the whole impetus around this law is to give individual officers um, discretion to ask about the, uh, immigration related matters. So um, let's let's get kind of concrete and it, let's think about an example. You might have a, a law enforcement agency that really is serious about prioritizing violent offenses, prioritizing uh, sexual assault, domestic violence over any any kind of drug offense or immigration enforcement, things like that. Doing, doing what, the, what we hope they would do. But if you have an officer, a detective, somebody on the scene who maybe doesn't jibe with that, um, maybe has has their own views, they might have discretion to do something that their boss might not prefer they do um, under under the wording of the law. So it's really, really important to, to think about not only what the statement is of the local agency, but also what individual officers and their individual discretion might decide to do uh, under this new discretion. Chris, we have a couple of questions, not just about places of worship, but also about um, shelters. So can ICE enter a shelter? And we know that it's, I think, state law that you can't enter a church or shelter, but does that apply if it's interfering with ICE assistance under federal law? Yeah, I, so so the question was, is, is ICE empowered to enter a shelter or a place of worship? I mean, I, I don't, regardless of what state law says, I think, I think DHS... Um, you know, and Adriana is, is going to chime in. I'm not going to steal her thunder on that because I'm sure she has a more um, nuanced perspective on that and, and has dealt with it firsthand. So I will defer to you, Adriana. Um, to summarize on, uh, on SB4 matters, um, what we have are a, a prohibition on limiting local law enforcement from enforcing federal law. Um, we have a prohibition on individual officers' authority, uh, or a prohibition on limiting individual officers' authority to ask people in detention about their immigration status. We do have an exception for inquiries or, or cooperation with immigration enforcement that occur at places of worship. Um, and we also say that officers aren't supposed to be inquiring about victims' immigration status, um, but they can if an individual officer deems it necessary to investigate the crime or because the individual officer perceives that they have probable cause that the victim was also engaging in some other criminal conduct at or around the time of their victimization. Clear as mud? We will, uh, I know that's a lot to take in um, and, and I 
we're not quite through the state law, but I want to give you a second to percolate on that because there's another provision that um, expressly contemplates shelters and rape crisis centers um, um, collaborating with your local law enforcement to, to, I think the intent is to help assuage fears among immigrant communities. And I, I think that um, one reason we felt it was very important to go through this express statutory language was to help you think through what those relationships may or may not look like in your community. So before I turn it back over to, to others, I want to go through this other provision. So there's a voluntary uh, section here that says that if, if a law enforcement agency wants to, they may adopt a written policy that um, basically implements an outreach program to the public and particularly to the immigrant community in their, in their uh, area um, to, promote the, to promote awareness of the idea that peace officers are not allowed to inquire about the immigration status of victims or witnesses. So the intent, and I'll, and I'll be I'll be blunt. This was an amendment um, tacked onto the bill um, pretty late in the process by some legislators who were opposed to the bill overall. Um, it's it, it was intended as a, a more or less of an olive branch between law enforcement and victims to 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 help people feel less afraid about this. Um, but it also requires, I think, some, some critical thinking about it on on our part as advocates. Because as we described, you know, what, what this says, what you see on your screen, what this says toward the bottom is true. That, you know, again, if somebody shows up as a victim or witness solely in that capacity, they are supposed to be limited to uh, asking about immigration status only in those two scenarios that you see there at the bottom. Um, but what this section doesn't contemplate is, is the last thing we talked about, right? Where a victim might have engaged in criminal conduct, um, collateral to their victimization, or maybe hadn't, but the, the individual officer may think they did or might feel like they have probable cause that they did. And in those cases, as we just, as we just saw in the statute, the officer is, in fact, empowered to ask about immigration status. So to the extent that an outreach policy described here is meant to inform people that, or to guarantee that peace officers will not be asking about immigration status is maybe not completely accurate, right? There may be scenarios where law enforcement can ask and, and will ask about immigration status and will cooperate in the enforcement of immigration laws. So um, to the extent that you or your program is approached by local law enforcement, or to the extent that you're thinking about approaching your local law enforcement concerning this kind of outreach policy, uh, I, I think that this is something really important to consider um, when when you're thinking about how to convey the limits of this law to your local immigrant community. Um, keep in mind that everything in this community outreach policy section doesn't quite align with uh, all the exceptions to the exceptions that we spoke about before. And one more question about if uh, if a person who is in the process of obtaining VAWA or a U visa and they get into a traffic violation or accident while not having a license, could this have repercussions on them? So, it, right. So if somebody has a pending VAWA or a U visa in process and then gets into a traffic accident while not having a license, you know, a traffic accident itself um, shouldn't be a criminal offense, right, that they're, that they're detained for. However, um, you know, depending on the local, um, the local uh, jurisdiction, um, they may be cooperating with like ICE detainers. And so if, if they're actively looking for, uh, looking to identify people who are undocumented, um, they, may, they may catch that. And the person very well might get caught up into the system, even though they have a VAWA or U visa application pending. Um, there may be ways to uh, uh, slow that process down and, and keep it from, from a full on removal. And I see Adriana is going to touch on this as well. So I appreciate that. But, um, I think I, I would say the short answer is, yeah, it, it could certainly cause complications and, uh, you would want to get that person linked up with an immigration attorney, uh, uh, as soon as possible, because a lot of these proceedings are very expedited. Thank you. 
So um, thank you, Chris, for making a lot of that <laughs> more understandable. I know I have a hard time making sense of all that text. Um, so now we're just going to spend a couple of minutes, and this is where, again, feel free to enter your comments or your questions into the chat box. Uh, but we're going to be thinking about, like, how should we be responding to this? And my first suggestion would be to look inward and to really take some time to evaluate how our agencies are providing services just in general. So given all this information, how will this impact your agency's ability to fulfill its mission? You know, what is your agency's mission? If it is to, to service all survivors in your communities, then you're going to have to take a look at if that's happening. So being able to disaggregate your data in terms of who are you serving? Um, what are the immigration statuses of your clients? Um, what are the ethnic and racial makeup of your clients um, and seeing if that jives with the makeup of your community, right? So are you gathering this data, number one, and are you analyzing it? And then, um, and in thinking about that, if we think about how people are going underground, how people are fearful of reaching out for help, how, um, how there is a atmosphere of fear, then how do we need to adapt our services and our outreach to be able to better accommodate vulnerable communities? So if your case management services, or your advocate services require someone coming into your rape crisis center, is there a way that you can better service your clients that doesn't put them at risk, right? So that they're not having to drive without a license, that they're not having to, um, leave their house if they're afraid that ice might be outside their door, for example, um, all of which are, are real scenarios that we've heard about. So we've heard about people, you know, being able to provide case management over the phone to accommodate that and basically think about getting creative about how we can better serve vulnerable populations. In addition to that, um, it's also a time to really think more broadly. We have a, a tendency to think about how do we serve survivors um, and thinking just about people in terms of their, um, about outreaching to people because of their victimization. And we also have to consider that they're part of a greater community. And so to be able to sufficiently and effectively serve those survivors, we will have to be able to engage authentically and sensitively with those communities as a whole, not just someone who happens to be a sexual assault survivor, someone who happens to be a domestic violence survivor. So this means, you know, who's already working effectively with immigrant communities? Um, who has those uh, relationships that, um, that you can then build relationships with so that you're more able to um, to gain credibility as a, as a person who is safe to go to for services. Um, and so really thinking about how you can foster and make sure that you deserve and earn a positive perception of your program amongst immigrant survivors. I see a couple of comments coming up. Um, We'll go to Adriana. So at this point, we are going to, um, if you have any questions or comments around that, and I think we've got a couple, um, please continue to enter them. And we are going to unmute Adriana. And Adriana, please go ahead and take the floor. Good morning, everyone. My name is Adriana Rodriguez, and I'm an attorney at Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. And I've had the pleasure of meeting many of you on the call. Or have you muted yourself? Can you hear me? Let's see. Oh, she's um, can you hear me now? Adriana, are you there? I think I think everyone else can hear me. 
Hey, Hunter, everybody else can hear. It's just us. Okay, I'll continue. So I've had the, I've had the pleasure of, of meeting so many of you, and I, I want to say before I get started with some very practical tips that your work has always been tremendously important to help survivors of violence, but now our clients have this added anxiety of, of immigration apprehension, of enforcement, and what that means for themselves, for their families, for their community. And so keeping current as advocates on the changing law and best practices is essential. And so I'd like to start with just um, giving you a sense of, of what the big picture means under this new administration. What we know, of course, from hearing, um, hearing Chris and, and Maya walk through SB4 for us is that local law enforcement may enter agreements with DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, to perform the functions of an immigration officer. So that would mean that local law enforcement could investigate apprehend and assist with detaining and processing uh, immigrants, including immigrant survivors. And so with that in mind, I do think it is important when we think through safety planning with clients that undocumented survivors of violence should avoid negative contact with law enforcement. So when you're thinking through safety planning to avoid negative contact with an abuser or a perpetrator, intimate partner or not, we should also have conversations with clients about consolidating errands, for example, conversations with clients about minding traffic laws or um, avoiding being out in the evening or avoiding um, maybe disagreements with the neighbors that could result in a phone call to local police. You know, we, we do want people to just be really mindful of how any interaction with law enforcement could unfortunately lead to an inquiry about their immigration status. The other thing that is worth emphasizing is that prosecutorial discretion is gone. And so there is no policy at present, no federal policy at present, calling for discretion when apprehending survivors of violence. We've seen this consideration in SB4, but you should know under the Obama administration, law enforcement was uh, advised to take into consideration whether someone was a victim of violence, if they, have, if they were the primary caretaker of minor children. Those are things we continue to emphasize as attorneys who are advocating directly with immigration to try to um, help the officer we are working with understand our client's circumstances. But under the Trump administration, really all immigrants are subject to being priorities for immigration enforcement. Now, the reality is uh, the federal government does not have enough resources to take action against everyone in the United States. That is just a reality. And so um, it's going to take uh, deciding for that apprehending officer who is a priority for processing or not. Um, the other thing everyone should know is that anyone with any kind of uh, immigration history um, is someone that you should talk to and, and figure out more or less what their experience has been at the border and what their experience may have been before immigration court. Um, also, anyone who has had any kind of criminal history, an arrest of any kind, even if it didn't lead to a conviction, is someone that should be connected with an attorney to figure out whether they are subject to um, reinstatement, detention, expedited removal, and I'll explain those things in just a moment. Now, earlier, someone asked about the effect of having a U visa or VAWA application on file. I want to emphasize, you should still continue to connect clients with agencies and attorneys that can provide those services. But an affirmative application, like a U visa or VAWA application, may not keep someone from being detained and may not keep someone from being put into deportation proceedings. It is something that could assist potentially in slowing down deportation proceedings, but having something on file helps. But um, in previous years, it's something that would prevent um, a negative encounter with law enforcement altogether. There is no guarantee that that is the case now. Now, I want to emphasize, because there is a lot of misunderstanding, our client, our immigrant client's ultimate goal 
is to avoid deportation. But that doesn't mean that they won't be apprehended. It doesn't mean they won't be processed for several hours. And it doesn't mean they might not be detained, even if just temporarily, until they can be bonded out of civil immigration detention to wait for their deportation proceeding. Okay. But their ultimate goal is to avoid deportation. Okay. And so it's important for our clients to understand that it is possible that they could be apprehended and detained. But detention doesn't necessarily mean deportation. So you might be wondering, yikes, this is, the big picture is rather scary. And so I want to just emphasize a couple of things for folks on the call. First, survivors should know if they are at risk for reinstatement. One is reinstatement. Reinstatement is basically having uh, someone who has a previous deportation order. Okay? So that means if an immigration judge or an immigration officer has uh, ordered you removed, then you are potentially subject to having that existing order enforced again. The other thing folks should know, number two, is expedited removal. Now, anyone who is in the country for less than two years without any immigration status, and that would include someone who has DACA status, if you have DACA status, you're in deferred action, right? So ideally, right, uh, immigration has decided they know you're here and you're not a priority for now. DACA is subject to some litigation now and some challenges, so stay tuned on DACA. But basically, anyone who's in the United States for less than two years could potentially be subject to an expedited removal, which in layman's terms is basically uh, removal by an immigration officer, not by an immigration judge. So it's very important for survivors who are afraid of returning to their home country to articulate their fear if indeed they are afraid of returning to their home country. Now, when we are talking about detention, we are talking about anyone, this is point number three, anyone who is present in the United States without permission, anyone with any kind of criminal history is potentially subject to immigration detention. Now, one of the examples here is if someone who has DACA status who's in the process of applying for residency is at risk of being detained or deported. The answer is yes, depending on what happens when they are apprehended, what kind of activity are they engaged in. DACA is just deferred action, but if you are apprehended or arrested for being engaged in some kind of criminal activity, um, immigration could start deportation or removal proceedings against you. Now, having an application for adjustment of status or to become a resident on file is helpful, right? But that doesn't mean that if you are considered a priority or caught, in quotation marks, doing something against immigration law, that you cannot be put into removal proceedings. So it's important to keep that in mind. And consider also that DACA and VAWA are, are really just deferred action statuses with work permits. The U visa is a, a better status for folks who can get the U visa. You're probably wondering, a lot of this is bad news. What should our clients know? Well, our clients, especially our clients on the border, should know that Border Patrol can pull someone over if they have a reasonable suspicion of an immigration violation, not just a hunch, okay? Our clients, if when they are apprehended, have the right to remain silent, but they should not interfere with any investigation or questioning. They don't have to consent to the search of their vehicle or their home, and they can always ask the apprehending immigration or law enforcement officer who's acting as an immigration officer if they are free to go. Now, I mentioned earlier expedited removal, potentially being subject to uh, removal by an immigration officer. One of the things we are considering in our safety planning, our immigration safety planning with clients, is advising them to carry school records U.S. children's birth certificates, uh, rent receipts or lease agreements showing they've been present in the United States for at least two years. Now, I would encourage uh, clients who can to consult with an immigration attorney uh, to make sure that these are immigration neutral documents, that they're not showing anything in those documents that they potentially carry around to to give any information or, or provide any information about their immigration status or whether they have any prior negative immigration history. But I want to emphasize clients who are at high risk of reinstatement or clients who uh, are potentially subject to expedited removal because they've been present for less than two, two years 
should consult with an immigration attorney. That is very, very important. I think this is an excellent time to warn our clients against notary fraud, notario fraud. It is really important that clients consult with trusted immigration attorneys and trusted immigration agencies. Nubia Torres is on this call and she's with Catholic Charities Dallas. There are other agencies in your, in your areas, regional agencies who can assist. Um, the other thing that is really important, like I mentioned, detention is possible for a lot of people who find themselves apprehended by immigration officers. Clients should make plans for their children uh, if they are apprehended. Who will care for their children? And, sh and clients should also make plans for the maintenance of their home, paying rent uh, in case they are, in fact, detained. Trala has a kit, the preparación, that we have shared with many of you who attended our shelter conference in June. There are other safety planning resources available on the web by uh, different trusted immigration agencies that you should consider consulting and sharing with your clients as they think through how to keep safe. Now, we've had a question about uh, whether someone who entered on a spouse visa and never applied is out of status and in a domestic violence situation. So essentially, this person has no status, and the police is called to the home if this particular victim could be detained as well as she hit the spouse, her spouse in self-defense. And I want to say that that is possible. Um, but again, I'm going to get to how your agency can help survivors report violence and how your agency can help advocate for victims in just a moment. So I'll speak to sort of practical next steps uh, shortly. So again, I want to emphasize all of the things that clients should know, and really having clients think through their own immigration history is tremendously important. So you might be thinking, how can our agencies actually help survivors report if any encounter with law enforcement could potentially subject them to negative immigration action? Well, Chris and Maya emphasize this, and I think it's tremendously important. Our agencies should remain involved with local law enforcement tax, task forces and coalitions and get a sense of what the local law enforcement response will be to apprehending immigrant survivors of violence. While we know that SB4 prohibits local law enforcement from engaging in any policy that would prevent the enforcement of federal immigration law, what are local law enforcement agencies doing to train uh, first responders to identify victims of violence? Are they connecting victims of violence with your agencies, whether they're rape crisis centers or shelters or community centers? You know, maybe this is a great time to put together a, a small business card or a small contact card that you can help distribute to local law enforcement so that apprehending officers or first responders know they can give your card to a victim and connect uh, your, the victims in your community with your agency. The other thing you can consider is helping victims report. Um, maybe victims can come to your agency um, if they have a delayed reporting, if they are nervous about calling uh, law enforcement from home because they are worried about their immigration history. If they come to your agency, you can assist with reporting. Um, and of course, we want to make sure victims know they can still call 911 for help, especially if they are in danger. But we want to make sure we're identifying folks who can support victims in delayed reporting, especially when it comes to sexual assault. Now, I want to, before I wrap up, I want to uh, speak to what your agency should do if ICE or local law enforcement appears at your agency to enforce immigration law. Just like we develop safety plans for our agencies, we should develop safety, excuse me, for our clients we should develop safety plans for our agency. Determine who at your agency will be the designated point of contact if ICE or local law enforcement comes to enforce immigration law. Decide who would review a warrant if it's presented, who's going to talk with officers, and who's going to call that attorney you'll have on standby if you need to consult with an attorney. Remember that all of you are bound by your own rules, your own procedures, your own regulations, and your funding requirements. And so no one can discriminate based on that national origin per VAWA, FIPSA, and of course the Texas Human Resources Code. So we are all still bound by um, those internal regulations. 
Remember, you don't have to permit agents to enter non-public areas of your building. You should at all times honor our collective duty of confidentiality to our clients for the Texas Government Code, the Texas Human Resources Code, and of course, VAWA, which requires uh, the need for a victim's consent or a court order, an order signed by a judge in order to um, breach confidentiality. And so really, I wanna emphasize for, for those of you who are worried about agents coming to your agencies, you are protected by VAWA confidentiality. That is our baseline commitment to our clients. Remind officers um, that VAWA prohibits enforcement actions at protected locations like shelters, like domestic violence shelters, like churches, like uh, community agencies, like courtrooms. But I want to emphasize that in our duty to uphold confidentiality, we should not lie, conceal, or mislead officers. That is very, very important. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that you'll have a point person to request to see a warrant if indeed ICE appears at your agency and re requests or demands entry. That warrant should be signed by a judge, not by a immigration supervisor, not by a regional supervisor, warrants to enter what are essentially homes, right, uh, need to be signed by a judge. And it is important to emphasize that you do not consent to ICE's entrance, and which is why you would need to consult with your um, supervisor, your director, your shelter's uh, attorney, right, depending on what your sh shelter's protocol is. And again, these practices will vary depending on your local um, policies, but it is important to have these conversations internally. When Chris and Maya tell us to turn inward and think about cl our client communities regionally, we should also turn inward and think about our agency's response to these kinds of, of visits. Um, I also uh, wanna emphasize that if indeed you are working with someone, an agent perhaps, who's making you uncomfortable or being aggressive, or in your opinion, not being very victim-centered or not being mindful of your duties as a shelter, your duties under VAWA, your duties under FIPSA, then get that information. Get that officer information, the location, get some information about witnesses, and be ready to complain to a local supervisor and work your way up. I also want to emphasize that if indeed, despite everything that you do to protect the victims at your agency or your shelter, someone is in fact apprehended, detained and processed and served with a charging document in immigration law called a notice to appear, you should compile, you can, you can file a complaint with the Department of Homeland Security um, and request a release of, of the client and really identify an immigration attorney who can support the client and work up the chain of command there. So there's a lot of information, and of course, I think TASA will be coordinating more information to you as we continue to develop best practices, but I want to flag for you a couple of resources. The ACLU of Texas has put together some information on SB4 and what it means for immigrants in Texas. MALDEV is in the process of putting together some advisals as well, and always check back in with TASA and if you have a great relationship with Charla, certainly check in with us, and we can do what we can to help you think through important next steps. But more than anything, please continue to work and stay current on changing law and continue to do all of the amazing work you do to support survivors of violence in Texas. Thank you so much, Adriana. I, I know that I always learn so much whenever whenever you talk, and I'm sure that goes for everybody here. So we really appreciate your time this morning. Um, we know you have a lot a lot going on down there. Um, and I, I want to echo something that Adriana said um, just toward the end there, that um, there are a lot of uh, organizations, a lot of folks in the state working hard to monitor this situation and, and continue to put out information as the situation may change. Um, I, I will say that the same goes for uh, for us here at TASA. The state law is set to take effect in 14 days. Um, as you may know, there has been a, a lawsuit already filed back in May um, to, to enjoin the law. Um, we're still awaiting a, a ruling from the San Antonio court to, um, to, to determine what's happening with that. So we'll be keeping a close eye on that 
in the next couple weeks especially. And um, based on the, uh, the questions we got uh, to this morning and uh, some of the additional information that just keeps coming in from, from the state and federal level, um, we're going to be continuing to, to do some trainings, webinars, perhaps materials on this and, and keeping you all uh, in the loop. Um, likewise, even if you don't, didn't have a question voiced this morning on the webinar, please reach out to us anytime if there's, if there's uh, another need or a, another just area of information that you, you feel like your program is, um, is in need of. Um, we, wanna, we wanna keep this an ongoing conversation because obviously regardless of what happens with SB4 as a state statute, um, this is gonna be an ongoing issue for survivors in Texas for, for quite a while. And I want to take this opportunity to clarify something. Um, Adriana, you'd mentioned that, um, and feel free to, to answer the chat or in person if you'd like. Um, but for, for agencies like rape crisis centers who may not necessarily have a shelter located in them, would the confidentiality also apply so that somebody would need to show up with a warrant or something signed by a judge? Is that correct? Uh, can you all still hear me? Yes. Okay. I think I think I would stand by that, um, and and just request to speak to a supervisor and have someone determine what it is is being requested. Uh, I think really our shelters and, and rape crisis centers can stand behind their duty of confidentiality. The way we don't confirm or deny someone is present or someone is a client, uh, that certainly carries over to any requests for information about our clients. Typically, we know that information of our clients should be requested by subpoena. And so someone just sort of appearing and asking to speak to someone or asking to access our records really requires a court order by a judge. And for everyone on the call, know that a subpoena is just a formal request for information uh, or documents. It's not necessarily an order signed by a judge until a judge orders you to comply with the subpoena. So Charles cares very much about subpoenas. If you have a concern about a subpoena you've been served with, contact Trala. Uh, Mari Carmen Garza is uh, very, very interested in helping shelters and rape crisis centers respond to subpoenas. Thank you so much for that. So we're just about at time, which is great because it means we've had some, some really good discussion, but we do have a couple of minutes before we wrap up. Um, if people have uh, additional things that are percolating on your mind, um, happy to uh, uh, address those in the time we have left. And I see that Molly, thank you for commenting from TCIB is also on the line. Molly, you can, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you, do you have anything that you'd like to add or I'm happy to unmute you? Mona, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Mona, not Molly. I'm, I'm having one of those mornings. Um, so Mona, if you would like to say anything, um, please let us know and, and we're happy to, to get you on. I also don't want to unmute you if you're not prepared for us <laughs> unmuting you. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks for joining us. If anybody else has any questions, I see one more. For DV situations, would it be best to advise clients to report later after an incident um, so the abuser cannot allege mutual violence? I would say delayed reporting should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. I, I do think if people are in danger, in actual danger in that moment where they, they could die or be hurt, we do want them to call for help, you know, and, and then we will do what we can on the back, the back end to advocate. Um, but delayed reporting, I would say, is something where you should consider calling from a safe place like a domestic violence shelter or rape crisis center. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to enter our emails into uh, the chat box, so you feel free to, to reach us at any time. Um, and we, again, we hope that this is a start of a conversation, uh, so we hope to keep it going and follow up with this um, as things develop and the, the field is constantly changing, things are constantly <laughs> happening, and um, so please uh, Keep looking out for new information, and we will definitely try to um, 
to keep y'all updated as we are updated as well. Thank you so much, Adriana, for, for all of that really amazing, useful information for everybody. Um, it, was, it was my absolute pleasure. And thank you all for, for so many of you turning out. This is probably one of our best attended webinars of all time, and it really shows that y'all are, are, are thinking hard about this and care a lot. So it, it does mean a lot. Thank you. Absolutely. We're grateful for the, for the hard work that you do, and uh, keep at it. Thank you all. Take care.